Our first reading this morning is from Genesis 15, verses 1 to 12, 17 to 18. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in the vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me, for I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house will be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess but he said O Lord God how am I to know that I shall possess it and he said to him bring me a heifer three years old a female goat three years old a ram three years old a turtle dove and a young pigeon he brought him all these and cut them in two laying each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land, and the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. The second reading is from the Philippians 3, 17 to 4, 1. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction, their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be confirmed to the body of his glory, by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, In this way, my beloved. The third reading is from Luke 13, verses 31 to 35. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen. I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, uh, your house is left to you, and I tell you, 
you will not see me until the end comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you dream often? Yes, some people do. Do you share your dreams? Some people do. (laughs) There's probably hundreds if not thousands of books written about dreams and the interpretation of dreams. Dreams are often full of surprises, images that in our wakeful state seem very strange. Some dreams have people falling, 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 falling. Is that a sign of helplessness, trying to get away from something? I myself dream pretty rarely, but I have woken up a couple of times with a sort of a big bang. I have no idea what that dream meant and generally I went back to sleep. And there's a dreamlike quality about our reading from Genesis chapter 15. And just as our nighttime dreams, we might be working through something that's happened the previous day, maybe a happy thing, maybe something that's been difficult and maybe in a very strange way. Very often we do in fact seek to interpret that particular dream. And so the clue lies in this well-loved phrase from Genesis chapter 15. Abraham believed the Lord and reckoned to him as righteousness. Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. This is indeed a wonderful sentence and developed by Paul in the letter to the Romans. But why was it written? Why is it included in this story of Abraham? Perhaps the answer lies in our tendency to listen and take note of what we want to hear. How much in fact goes in one ear and out the other. But here, in this particular situation, do we really hear what the dream may be trying to tell us? In times of grief, for example, we might take more notice of the Psalms. In times of celebration, we look to one of the happy Psalms or one of Jesus' parables. Or we might refer to one of the letters of Paul. So who indeed are the people who needed to hear these words recorded in Genesis 15? Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Remember the people of Israel went to Babylon in a time of exile. There they felt abandoned, deserted by God. They no longer had the temple. Many of them probably had forgotten many of the laws. They probably weren't carrying out the rituals like circumcision. How could they think of themselves as being blessed by God when they were way out there in Babylon, way from, away from Jerusalem, away from the temple? Reflections on Abraham's experience can shed light on our current situation. Abraham was called by God long before there was a temple, long before there was the law of Moses, long before there was any ritual like circumcision. And yet, Abraham is acceptable to God. How can this be? Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Many of our life's experiences filter through into our dreams but few experiences are so traumatic as they unsettle or disturb our faith. Faith, both in the sense of trusting God and in the sense that 
This understands our relationship with God. When such a crisis occurs, the story of Abraham might come again to our minds to help us to hang in there, just as it helped the Israelites to hang in there in Babylon when all else had been taken away. And in due course, they did return to Jerusalem and the temple was restored and life continued. And this leads to today's gospel, a rather bizarre story, sometimes like those odd dreams which really don't make sense very much to us. Here in Luke chapter 13, we have a seemingly ordinary scene involving Jesus and the Pharisees. We know there were many times when Jesus and the Pharisees were in confrontation. But what's odd about this story is it seems that the Pharisees are trying to help Jesus. Get away from here because Herod wants to kill you. Now why would the Pharisees say that to Jesus? It could be that they were really being helpful because we do know a few of the Pharisees did in fact take to Jesus and maybe became followers. So it may be they were being helpful. Get away from here. Herod wants to kill you. But there's another possibility. Get out of here. You're on our patch and we don't like you. Go away. Go away and hide like Elijah did in the Old Testament. Get out of our way. Well, take which interpretation? Maybe neither of them are correct. But Jesus is not the kind of person to run away. In fact, he rather roundly abuses Herod, using the rather derisory or derogatory term, that fox. Indeed, it has been said that Herod is the only person in the gospel whom Jesus treats with contempt. In the phraseology of St John, Jesus' response to Herod was, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Jesus' departure would happen not at the time of Herod's deciding, but at the time of God's deciding. Here, We see Jesus totally in control, not manipulating, but seeking to do his Father's will. Not my will, but yours be done. But then goes on in the next part of that chapter, Jesus lament over Jerusalem. Jesus sees that Jerusalem is going to be in big strife. Just as the people in the Old Testament had rejected the prophets, so the people of Jerusalem are rejecting him. Not only Herod, not only the Pharisees, but the whole population missed their chance. But there is a word of hope when Jesus says, You shall not see me again until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now again, this is ambiguous. Could it be referring to the entry into Jerusalem, which would take place shortly? Or does it refer to the time, even now, when Jesus is with us through the Spirit? Sometimes we need to be reminded that Jesus didn't always speak as if, reading from a plain sheet. There is an ambiguity in his words, even in his presence. And living with ambiguity is something which provides a fertile ground for all of us growing to maturity. Which leads to a brief comment on the Philippians passage. Paul loved the Philippians and wrote encouragingly to them, but 
He says in chapter 4, verse 1, Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. Paul is reminding the church at Philippi that being a Christian should show itself in the members' life and behaviour, the way they live, the way they direct their desires. And sadly in Philippi, some were living under the delusion that they could say they belonged to Christ while at the same time being against Christ, ruled by the Spirit, ruled, sorry, ruled not by his Spirit, but by destructive appetites and motives. Paul speaks of the belly and shame and earthly things to describe how limited were their affections, how self-seeking they were, and their ambitions were light years away from truly walking with Jesus. Paul counteracts this by telling the Philippians to look up, as it were, to heaven, the place where we are most fully at home, the sphere of where we belong. And as citizens of heaven, we look with joy to the coming of the Saviour, who will effect the final and glorious transformation of our bodies. Then the earthly and destructive appetites and the temptations will finally be no more. And it won't be a dream. It will be for real. Everything will be for real as real can be. Last week, Bruce reminded us that Lent was not just something of what we give up. Our coffee or our chocolates or... What did Casey say? Being naughty. What are we adding to our lives in Lent? There's the opportunity for extra times of prayer and meditation. There's extra time for being involved in one of the Lenten studies. It might mean going out of our way to help somebody we see in need. It certainly could involve putting our offering, our, our donation in the Lenten appeal. I'll confess it wasn't until yesterday that I actually read some of those stories there. Have you read the stories? Of Adele in Zimbabwe, the livelihood projects. Of Deborah in South Sudan, midwifery training. Of Martha in Vanuatu, the Women for Change project. For Anajan in Sri Lanka, education, inclusive of children with disabilities and learning difficulties, and Agnella in West Papua, the HIV and TB clinic. Let's all add something in Lent in our closer walk with God in Jesus Christ. And here again these words from Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, Stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. Amen.